All right, hey everybody, and welcome to the stream. Okay, this is gonna be great. This is the Schoolism multi-drawing uh, costume, or sorry, Magma is the sponsor here. Um, you know, multi-drawing costume design, worst intro ever, but this is gonna be fantastic. All right, let's check out what we're gonna be drawing today. Oh my goodness. So this is gonna be, Awesome. Everybody's going to be doing costumes, riffing off of this photograph, and uh, it's just going to be fun, you know? That's the idea, to do something fun. Okay, panelists? So feel free to talk amongst yourselves. You know, you don't have to wait for me to ask any questions. I'm here if the conversation gets boring, and I will ask a bunch of questions or whatever. And we also have uh, questions coming in from the audience. All right, so... Um, maybe we could start off with some introductions. Let me put everybody's uh, videos on screen here in the corner. Okay, so starting first, Kyle Brown. What do you what do you tell uh, what do you tell artists that you do? Fantastic. Next up is uh, Mikey Wandy. Currently at Marvel uh, MCU Biz Dev. Fantastic. Uh, Phil Boutet Jr. Hello, everybody. I'm a costume concept artist working in primarily film, and I am currently also at Marvel Biz Dev. Awesome. Uh, should I be at Marvel D Vista? <laughs> yes, you should, Claire. You <laughs> <We'll> should. <laughs> Snatching up everyone. Where are you? Come with us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we go to the next person here on my screen? We have Ar Armand Baltazar. Oh, hi. I am uh, Armand Baltazar. I'm a former uh, art director from Pixar and biz dev artist, but now mostly I work as an author and illustrator for a book series. Fantastic. Called. Timeless. Oh, called yeah. Timeless. Yeah, called yeah. Timeless. <laughs> Thanks. A movie being produced by Ridley Scott. Wow. Yeah, that, that's oh, pretty yeah. cool. That's a pretty good that's feather amazing. in your cap. All right, yeah. next person here is Imogene Chez. Hello. Um, I'm a costume concept artist. I'm also working at Marvel VizDev. <laughs> Sarah, we need to change jobs. Oh, I gotta, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's basically it. I'm uh, mainly working on their new Disney Plus series projects, and it's super fun. And they're they're now forcing me to do keyframes. Yeah. Cool. yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. Uh, <laughs> next one we have here is uh, Charlie Wen. Oh, you're muted, Charlie. What happened to the sound? No, we just got it sounding so good, too. Yeah, it yeah. sounds great. What's going on? Hmm, why don't we give Charlie a second here, and we'll go to Bree Henderson, uh, late edition. Hello, I'm a late edition. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst intro ever, again. I'm sorry. But, Actually, uh, best. That's all I'm going to call you now, Brie, from now on. I'll be like, what's up, late edition? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, uh, oh, man, that makes me feel like the unwanted child. But listen, no. I get all the goodies because everyone feels bad for me. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, hi, I'm Brie. Um, nice to meet you all. And I, I work at, um, where do I work? I don't know. I work at Netflix Animation, and I work at DC Comics. Fantastic. Nice. And and uh, Tian, Yan, uh, Yang Tian Li, Tian. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yang Tian Li. I, I'm currently working at Amazon Game Studio uh, as a concept artist. Fantastic. Uh, thanks. And Charlie, how are we doing there? You're on mute right now, or let me unmute you. Did I unmute you? Did we both press mute at the same time? <laughs> That's so odd. We just had the sound going. 
No. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes! yes. Hey. Yay. But, um, hi, I'm Charlie. Uh, I, I guess along with about maybe 80% of the guys here, I used to be at Marvel. Uh, <laughs> a time ago, I'm actually, and so I've been in games and uh, film, and now I'm starting my own studio uh, for entertainment, for film and games as well. Awesome. Nice. Fantastic. Welcome everybody. Uh, so I, I should want... I introduce myself? Oh my God, Claire! I'm oh, sorry no. because the pictures keep I moving around. I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you, Claire. Thank you so much, Claire Hummel. Everybody, Claire. Yay! No, hi. I'm a <laughs> I'm a concept artist and art director in games. Um, I've been in games for the past ten years. Uh, joined Campo Santo a couple years ago, and then we all got acquired by Valve. So that's where I'm at now. Fantastic. I don't think I missed anybody, did I? Did I miss anybody? Just, so. just, just yell at me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, anybody want to talk about the idea that they're going for right now? Some interesting things happening. All right. If not, we'll go no, to... No, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little too early. Uh, we can give some context for the prompt we've been given, I think. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, because Armand is working on, on his series that sort of exists in a place, not a place out of time, but has a lot of time travel and people being thrown together from different time periods. So we're currently working on designs for a character that would exist in that world. So having, being rooted to the time period they're from, but also having that flexibility to have future technology, modern technology, anything like that. I think, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we could give a little plug to your, uh, you know, your epic story. Armand, can you give us oh. a little uh, synopsis? Sure, yeah, thanks. So the, uh, the book series is called Timeless. Uh, the first book is uh, Timeless, Diego and the Rangers of the Vast Atlantic. And it takes place in our world. It's not an alternate reality, but it's our, our world. But something happens 300 years from now. Um, time is shattered and everything is obliterated and goes away. But exactly two minutes later, the world comes back, but the world comes back different. What ends up happening is time shattered uh, and is put back together with pieces of the past, the present and future. People coexist from different time periods uh, animals that have gone extinct like dinosaurs and other things have, have come back and people are now forced to live with each other um, from different times in a world that's completely different. Continents have changed, oceans have changed shape and in this people are struggling to gain control of this world and, and dominate it or, or establish a new rule. Meaning like should it be from the people of the past, the people of the present, the people of the future here we meet Diego, a 13-year-old boy whose father is a scientist and an engineer, and his, his father is kidnapped by a second century Roman general. And when no one will do anything to uh, save Diego's dad, Diego uh, elicits three mercenary pirates, a mysterious Russian sea captain from an unknown time, a Civil War veteran, uh, and a boy from the French Revolution. Uh, joined by Diego's best friends, a girl from uh, Victorian England, a boy from the 1920s, and Paige, a skater, tough skater girl from 1984. Uh, they travel across the ocean, That's encounter awesome. dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, they encounter the remnants of a Nazi Air Force and the Imperial Japanese Air Force, now in the employ of this Roman general. Uh, there's robots, there's dinosaurs, and we end up finding out what changed the world in the series and possibly the one terrible way to change it all back. And it's about mm -hmm. a kid trying to get his dad back. Man, you got that pitched down. I want to ask, <laughs> you know, like uh, we've probably all done a bunch of pitches, you know, so what was it like the first couple times pitching that story? Cause it's a hard one to kind of ball yeah, up it's... into, you know, a minute or two. <clears throat> Right. It was um, it was tough. You know, the thing is, it was that uh, the story, like every person, concept artist, one, you know, who's got an idea in their head, they go like, I want to make something really cool. And so uh, 
that was doubly hard when I was tasked by my son. This is where it all started. He goes, Dad, I want this kick ass. Wait, are we? Uh, can I say the word? Can I say that word? Uh, <laughs> well, it's yeah, too late sure. now. <laughs> okay, well, anyways, it was my it was my young son at the time. He goes, I want this kick ass story. And he goes, and it'd be great if you made it for me. And I'm like, all right, yeah, cool, I can do Aww. that. What do you want? And he goes. I want there to be dinosaurs. And I go, okay. And he goes, right. no, no, but dad, there's got to be samurais. Yes. And I go, okay. And he goes, oh, but dad, it's got to have World War II airplanes in it. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, son. And he keeps rolling out this stuff. And there's got to be robots in there. And, you know, he keeps rolling all the stuff that he likes. And he goes, oh, and dad, here's the best part. And I go, uh, I don't know. This list is already pretty long, son. He goes, he goes I want to be like Indiana Jones. <laughs> And I go, yeah. that's awesome. I, I go, wait a minute. I can't, I'm not going to put Indiana Jones in your story because, you know, you're the hero of the story. And he goes, no, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want Indiana Jones in the story. I want to fight off the Nazis like Indiana Jones did in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Respectable. Yeah. Yes. I'm like, all right. Okay. So I got to have Nazis. So I had all this stuff I had to put in there. And when people were asking me what uh, I was trying to do, you know, I couldn't really come up with an answer because I couldn't figure out, well, how the heck am I going to get all these crazy different things together? And first I thought, oh, I know, I'll make a time machine movie. And then I started thinking, oh, no, no one's going to do it better than H.G. Wells and no one's going to do it better than, uh, you know, Robert Zemeckis in a DeLorean. So I thought, I can't do that. I'll do it the other way. And I'll, I'll uh, come up with a story where uh, time comes to a kid. And so that's how I came up with the... Um, the elevator pitch i started thinking well how am i going to put bring time to a kid and i started testing this out on people i tested it out on some folks at pixar who gave me some good advice I'm like no that makes no sense no that makes too much sense goes, don't make complete sense make just enough sense <laughs> and uh given that little piece of advice i, I kind of worked on crafting this little thing and that, that's how it happened uh, any that's fantastic by the way Amazing. and congratulations Sorry. on that um, Thanks. Yeah, it sounds like such an undertaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> pitching yeah. has been something that I've always been interested in because uh, those are things I do as well. Anybody else have any kind of good advice about pitching from the many pitches that you might have done? Maybe Charlie, Charlie, yeah. pitching a lot of stuff, I'm assuming. I, well, just, just do it a lot. <laughs> just do it a lot. Ultimately, for me, it was just uh, making sure I do a lot. And then for, for me, um, you know, just um, writing, writing it over and over as well for me, just, just so that I can write it in different ways, so I can say it in, um, to different people, uh, whether I'm saying it to, to younger kids or saying it to like, uh, um, a studio exec. Just, so I'm just trying to practice it in different ways. Um, it's kind of like teaching, like if you're teaching and you, you have lots of different types of students in the, um, in the class, being able to explain it in different ways is going to be important. So I think that, that's another, another thing. Right. Fantastic. Uh, something else that I would love to know is, you know, um, there's a lot of people here that have designed costumes and everything or worked on costumes. Um, for live action, what's the big difference? Or what's like the thing that you realized when you started working that you didn't know before you started working? I'll go with that one. I'll say I didn't, um, I didn't realize how much detail went into costumes before I started working in costume or even, I don't even know if I paid them much attention. I paid attention to them, but not in the way that I pay attention to them now like the subtle details of seams and where things go and you know uh, design lines and form and function and you know thinking about like you know stuff like stunt <coughs> harnesses and all that stuff i i think it, it kind of grew for me and the the love for costume grew from uh from paying attention to those details i think and really getting into like what are costumes uh why do people wear what they wear um why does this character dress this way or feel this way? Um, 
and then overall just being inspired by all the artists around like you know being inspired by artists that were sitting there and working on characters and designing costumes and all that so i think it was kind of a a balance a, a gradual uh pull and then i have to give it a shout out to charlie um because of, with charlie and ryan on um a minor game on captain america that was the first time that i really saw concept art close up um where I understood the power of being able to take an idea and design or taking even just reference and, and turning it into something else. I used to sit and just watch Charlie paint and draw. I'm um, in his office, I'd bug him and go just watch. And it would be funny because he'd have something on his desk. Like he'd have like a, a little model of something like a tank or something. He's like, so you take this and then you turn it into a guy with a flamethrower. And I'm like, how did you do that? <laughs> so it was a really good inspiring moment for me because before that, um, a lot of us that work in costume, we work for the costume designer, right? So we work with the costume designer that's giving us ideas. And then ultimately our job is to illustrate their ideas and kind of bring them into fruition. Um, you know, uh, with an idea that they can take or with a drawing they can take to the meeting. But concept art became the time, seeing concept art and watching the guys work made me realize that there is a job where you're brought in for your, uh, your ideas and your thoughts and like what you can bring to the table. And that's, that was like the spark of inspiration where I was like, that's what I want to do. So it's like, I didn't, and I didn't know any of that before I started working. Well, something I never thought about was just like the functionality of stuff. Yeah. Right. Like, just how things work. Period. Yeah, in games, animation, you can make the most dangerous outfits, like for the actor ever, because there's yeah. no actor, right? right. He has oh, yeah. blades Suddenly all over him. Oh yeah, you can have giant pauldrons that are facing right towards the <laughs> and you can just kind of make them conveniently miss in the rig. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> It's like, I don't like this actor very much. <laughs> <laughs> now, we could go to some questions. Um, why don't we do that? First question here is coming from Kipling. Kipling says, biggest hurdle in your earlier career that you had to overcome? Mm. Oh, can I answer that? Sure, yeah, of oh, course. I'm still, I'm still quite early in my career, um, and for me, it's, well, I went to school initially for fashion design, um, and then I moved, in, I burned out really bad, and then I moved into um, visual development, because I Frozen was released, and I was like, oh shit, I can do costume design for um, animation instead of actual people. <laughs> um, and so I moved into that, and, and for me, my biggest hurdle has been trying to like find my place like last year i ended up going back to school i went i got into fitum um for fashion design with the intention of going into costume design for live action um because i wanted to you know design stuff like the witcher or catherine the great or you know the tutors and things like that game of thrones um and then COVID hit and then quarantine hit so i'm back to square one which is fine i love where i am it's okay um but you know gosh it was it's like for me i i feel like costume design for live action is always like right out of reach for me like i can sew i can you know do all the jazz you know but it's always just right out of my reach just all of my connections span animation you know all of them like none of them go into live action and it's been such a pain in the beans but that's fine. And then I met Phil. <laughs> yeah, so not anymore. Now we're going to help you. <laughs> and then I met Phil. So, you know. Um, the magic been... of Lightbox, for sure. Yes. Gosh, the magic of Lightbox. Bobby, look at you changing lives. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I think it's but Uncle it's Phil been... changing lives. <laughs> <laughs> There's but, a lot know, of people that have it's mentioned been a Phil. Journey. Like, the, but the thing is, though, even even in costume design for animation, you still worry about the scenes. You still, at least I do. You still worry about practicality. You still worry about how the character is wearing the garment or how the garment is wearing them. You know, you still do fabric references and things like that because you want to get it right. Because different fabrics fall differently. Like snakeskin is not going to fall like silk, or silk is not going to fall like gauzy muslin. You know what I mean? So it's like, even in like what the the sketch I'm doing now, like this super futuristic business over here, you know, 
You're, you're still safe, aware huh? of what the fabrics are going to be. Exactly. You're still yeah. aware. You have to be aware. Well, um, nowadays with animation and games where it's just like sims are so common and using marvelous designer like suddenly all all of these skills of of pattern drafting and being able to sew is yeah. infinitely more relevant than it was before yeah and i think audiences can weirdly just pick up on when something looks fake like they can't yeah. tell you why but we've all been wearing clothes most of our lives i assume and so i think people can just pick up on the details and figure out when something just doesn't quite feel right right and like on the subject of pattern drafting, I know it's not a favorite of people, but unpopular, unpopular opinion. I love pattern drafting. Love pattern. So for me, that's like, like all the seams and things like that. I mean, all the panels and you know all that fun jazz. It's not like random for me. Like in my head, I'm deconstructing and constructing it. You know, mm -hmm. like it means something. Um, huh. I love it. It makes me like <laughs> do a little dance in my chair every time. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was talking about this in another panel where um, the VMAs. I don't know if you guys caught that, but it was like multiple outfits where the private parts light up. And I was like, that's so weird how like trends happen all at the same time. I think it's yeah. like Doja <laughs> Cat and Black Eyed Peas. Black Eyed Peas, yeah. You yeah. could not like take your eyes off their junk because it just kept lighting up <laughs> <laughs> like how Lord does that God. happen does that start, it first kind of happen from a fashion show or something or like people are yeah. seeing each other's kind of productions you know like what's going on there does anybody know i think it's just trends also too they have people that are working it's a constant balance between the different styles and the people they work with they're all kind of uh, yeah. Uh, someone in here was a Delia Dead Set fashion show. I think it's also that it's taking all uh, it's all of the things that they put together and taking fashion and kind of spitting it back out. And sometimes when you do that, you run the risk of having <laughs> glowing junk <laughs> from everybody. <laughs> Who would have thought that would be a problem? Yeah. <laughs> no, nothing wrong with a glowing junk so long as it's you know. A clean glowing junk. We're in quarantine. Whose junk really is glowing and clean right now? It's a whole other conversation. I remember years ago, Kay was telling me, uh, in the future, girls are going to stop wearing pants. And I'm like, what do you mean they're going to stop wearing pants? <laughs> no, for their performances, and then it's going to dribble into like real life. Like They're going to be wearing dresses and skirts. No, they're just going to you know, and then you see it, you see Beyonce performing and it's like, where'd your pants go? You know, and things like that. And now it's like a normal thing, <laughs> like we all, but you know, uh, six years ago or whatever, that was, that was really out there. Remember? The, yeah. Here, here's it's the thing it. though. Hey, I, mean, I, Oracle. I gotta, I gotta mention it for all the, like someone saying now bras too, they just want to get rid of everything. I think, um, I mm -hmm. think that I, I got to mention it for them as like uh, female clothing, especially, you know, the more that I've studied uh, costume is kind of ridiculous um, in the sense that it doesn't, for whatever re reason, have function. It's like they have pockets that aren't pockets oh, or oh. or they or nothing that they have has pockets. Why are you um, making me mad for? <laughs> so I'm saying we got to fix that. That's the thing. Before we go full blown into the future where we're just like, hey, let's get this garment that does something really cool. It's like. How about just pockets? <laughs> How about some pockets? Well, well, hold on. On. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I look for when I get pants and stuff, shorts. It's like, how big are these pockets? It's like. Wanna, if you want to make your wife happy, get her a dress that has pockets. <laughs> get her something that has pockets. She'll be super excited. <laughs> I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes. That is it. That is a good note. <laughs> that is All a good right. note. Uh, Carlo asks, and also uh, for the attendees, raise your hand if you want to ask a question. I'll hand you the mic. But Carlo's asking, how's everybody's day? And I'll, I'll top it off with any highlights from anybody. Oh, so many highlights today. <laughs> too, many, too many kind of names. I think... Um, 
it's hard because there's so many people, like there's so many things to watch and to do um, all at once. I, I will say just a general highlight for me has been just digitally walking the floor and mm -hmm. going through and seeing everybody's artwork, uh, getting surprised by videos that pop up of the artists themselves saying, hey, you reached my, you know, my booth. Thanks for coming. Check this out. Um, I like the interconnectivity of having it not be to where lightbox.com is just the hub. It's like it spans you out to all these different artist pages. It spans you out to just the internet at large. And that's been really fun. And then random conversations happen in Discord and all these different things in Twitch and stream. I've been having a really good time at home. Just like I don't feel like I'm sitting in front of my computer, which has been nice because I'm always in front of my computer, but interacting with the artist now is a highlight for the weekend. Well, that's sure. fantastic to hear like really we just want to give everybody a good weekend you know and just kind of go back to our roots connect as artists so that's that's really nice to hear all right so let's go to one of the questions i think i forget who rose their hand first i'm gonna go with elizabeth hello elizabeth hello where Hi. are you from what's your question we, we actually talked this morning. <laughs> uh, my question for everybody is, what is your costume to go? What's your favorite piece of oh. costume that you've ever worked on or that you feel mo most comfortable designing in general? I'm definitely very good with historical stuff, personally. Um, I got very into it when I was younger and it's it's a, a sandbox that I really enjoy playing around with, with, sort of looking up those references and playing them and changing them, even if we're doing something like this, which is not strictly historical, it's just a neat sort of jumping off board for design. Mm -hmm. I have so much admiration for people who do contemporary because it's really hard to do well. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work. I I have to agree. Um, give me give me you know anything like a chemise de la reine or <laughs> give me something like um, like what I have now. It's it's like this person would never live on the streets in like a super cyberpunk world. This person lives like way in the clouds. Is hella rich kind of thing. Like give me both of those, but never in the middle. But if I'm going in the middle, give me like streetwear like super yep. like dope street underground hip-hop like like inspired by scandinavian and korean street clothing but yeah give me like old and, and super future <laughs> i'm gonna third that and also <laughs> say that I, yeah, everything i have to study uh especially culturally or historically is like definitely my interest I don't find myself getting to work, uh, like work on actual films or projects that actually have that, but my personal work um, tends to be filled with that for sure. Same. Yeah, I feel that. <laughs> I find myself really drawn right now to Afrofuturism. So I, I, I feel like I'm, that's kind of the vein that I'd like to create at this point, like kind of learning, uh, I think after Black Panther, I really wanted to learn more about the different tribes and mm -hmm. like why they do stuff as opposed to just doing it from a visual standpoint. Like I want to know what are those beads and what do they mean? And mm -hmm. What does the color mean? And like, who's the tribe and like, where are they located? Like, I think that that was kind of, uh, uh, that was kind of the, or that's where I'm kind of been mentally and then trying to spit that back out conceptually is really fun. You know, all the things you learn. Lisa? That feels like such right. a thing that people might not realize about costume design, the fact that it's not just, it's not fashion design, it's not just aesthetic. Mm -hmm. You're trying to create these cultures, you're trying to give this context and intention culturally and personally for the character you're designing. Like, there's so much thought yeah. behind each of those decisions. Correct. Yeah, there better be, right? Or else there's going <laughs> to be <Touché>. bad. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, bring back the beard. Where's this guy's beard? <laughs> I like. I was so focused on the feet. I went back and I was like, "Where did he go?" <laughs> Lisa, you have been the mic. bamboozled. The main parts. 
I mean, I think this might be the part of uh, previous. Oh, in the hold on. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, didn't. Sorry, out of nowhere. <laughs> there's a little bit of a bad cut here, but uh, Lisa is from the audience. Oh, and hi, I Lisa. Gave her the mic. Oh, hey, Lisa. Hi, Lisa from the audience. <laughs> Hello, howdy. I hope everyone's having a great day. My uh, question to get to that. Um, I guess in this day and age of, I guess, um, influencers and celebrity fashion, um, who, well, I guess you probably already answered it because um, I came in late. Um, is there a current celebrity or a, a celebrity before 2000 that really like motivates you today, in, like influences you today in your work? I'm gonna say no for me personally, but that's, I'll just end, I'll leave that there. I'll just say no. There's no current celebrity that influences my work today. I'm sorry, not like pop celebrity. Like it could be Nosferatu. Like, I'm sorry, like a fa like a famous image. Oh, okay. Like an artist? Okay. Yeah, my bad. It wasn't worded properly. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna say mine is an artist named Gustav Klimt who yeah. he really didn't, I wouldn't say he particularly like was fashion, but he made a lot of fashionable choices, so to mm -hmm. speak, in work. Um, he's definitely one of my favorites to look at. Um, also, he had a girlfriend who also dabbled in um, the, pat the fashion world and was a beast too. And so you can kind of see some of those influences in, in his work just a little bit. Um, but I really like that. I like how he's not necessarily so much to one side he's kind of like in the middle um and kind of created his own identity based on that absolutely that's a great one if i could have any piece of art i would probably want a uh, klimt yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah klimt and muka for sure mm -hmm. yeah i like for me i like uh looking at georges barbier um a uh, french illustrator um a lot of his stuff is very fashion forward <laughs> and very art deco, very beautiful, beautiful work. But then I also like um, Erte. Erte? Yeah. yeah. I, like him too. I was just thinking, yeah. <laughs> one. Um, but, and then also, if we're going to talk about, you know, um, Muka for a hot second, you know, there are other, other um, Art Nouveau illustrators out there who unfortunately just like go so far under the bus because Muka was such. A powerhouse but mm -hmm. in our nouveau spans so far sometimes it can even bleed into art deco like if you're looking at Jean barbier like his the way he handles curves can be so outstanding but he's he's an art deco artist but um yeah. do you feel like um like art history properly filters out you know what's important and what's not <laughs> oh absolutely yeah. like the Mona Lisa is important because it was manufactured to be important, right? And so it's so often just whoever's popular at the time, and it's often a bunch of straight white dudes, and mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who fall by the wayside. And I feel like you see a lot of movement right now in art history circles to just give people the credit they were due and really dig down to the roots of, you know, who was Picasso looking at and stealing yeah. from that sort oh, of thing. Oh, yeah. Huh. That one's a big one. You know, nowadays when I go to schools and such and ask people, what are their favorite, who are their favorite artists? They're generally almost all uh, social media, you know, they're on social media. And yeah. it's no longer like, oh, I like Sargent or I like, you know, uh, oh. NC Wyeth and stuff like that. Like far more, it's, oh, I like that person. I watch his YouTube channel. And that could be kind of that. dangerous, right? That yeah, could be kind of dangerous. Yeah. 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 I have a quick, uh, one, one last quick question slash insert. Because, like, like, someone I like is, is have you heard of Erica Badu? Oh, yeah. 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 I, I adore her um, avant garde take on fashion um, and um, Afrofuturism. I think one of you mentioned. And She's so, wonderful. Mm hmm. And so, like, because I do um, 
you know, concept art and character art. Does that, is that a smart way, I guess, to like think of people who already exist or is it smarter just to like take on like art concepts that- Here's what I, I have a strong opinion about this. This, this is what I'll say about that is it's good to have, uh, I, I always encourage, especially students or people that are wanting to learn, I want you to challenge yourself to look at Erica Badu as a reference, right? And then look underneath and look at what she's referencing. Yes. That's mm -hmm. that's the part. So take that part, look at what she's referencing, and then build your, your influences from there because that's where you learn. Because then you'll find out what she's, not copying, but she's inspired by something, right? The best thing to do is to find what people are inspired by and then dig underneath that. And then if you can get to that point, so say she's inspired by the Dinka tribe and she's wearing some kind of horns in her ears or something. Look at the Dinka tribe and then figure out what the why the Dinka tribe wears those horns in their ears and what they mean. And then from there, that will inspire you to then have information to take that concept and turn it into whatever you want. So it's literally like, that's what's so dangerous when Bobby talks about that is, is the sense that instead of being like a copy of a copy of a copy, you know, like when you see people mm. in their drawing drawings from other people, like mm. when I look at my favorite artists and I'm looking, I'm like, what was Claire drawing? What was Claire drawing from when she drew that? But I don't want to copy Claire's drawing. Absolutely. Because then you can spit it out in your own way. That's how you end up making, you know, it making yourself go to a different place, I think. But that's a good style icon to follow. So I think have your style icons and then go underneath and find what those style icons are looking at. Mm -hmm. I think Claire, he just low key uh, complimented you as one of his favorite artists. Stop, stop stealing my art. <laughs> but it's oh, so I'm, stealable. What do you mean? I feel I am in rarefied company right now. I feel like some of the f my favorite uh, designs or whatever, universally, whether they're costumes or characters, it's always like influenced by something that's so far from that subject, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I went to this place, I saw this building, and then I built this jacket. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Clothing is like architecture. Yeah, I mean, in its own way, it yeah. is. Well, Phil, you have a great story about that. Um, I forget that is it Michael Kaplan who gave you a rock and said to make a costume out of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cool. yeah, Michael. Michael's a really great. Uh, he's a costume designer, Blade Runner, uh, all the star, a lot of the Star Trek, Star Wars. He's just a prolific designer and. He has all of these different thought processes and ideologies. Um, and so at one point, because he's always conceptually kind of thinking about something, but he also can be very uh, abstract. So there was at one point where we were working on some suits for Star Trek and he had found this like pebble or this rock that was like really shiny and smooth, but it was like the perfect shade of like blue that he was looking for. So he brought it and kind of sat it on the desk and he was just like, he's like, look at what I found. This is it, this is the suit. And he kind of walked off and I was looking at it like, like, what like, you know, like like what do you want me to do with this but we, we ended up figuring it out after um he also taught me if i could just keep talking he also taught me how to um he taught me about how to use history conceptually um and mm -hmm. that's that's a lesson i actually took with me so when we were doing the first star trek there's a costume if you go back and watch it winona Ryder played uh spock's mother right uh, and so for Vulcan women, women, Michael wanted to create some shape on the chest plate uh, that made them look kind of flat and kind of androgynous. Um, and so I asked him why he wanted to do that. And he said that throughout history, the female costume specifically, a lot of the times their female clothing is through the male gaze. So he said, men, co female costumes are what they wear will accentuate certain assets or whatever based on what men find attractive. So he's like, okay, bustles, you know, big butts and hips and all that stuff, or corsets, uh, thin waist, all of those things. So his thought process for that in looking at actual history was he wanted to figure out what Vulcan men find attractive. And since Vulcans are intellectuals, he said that it's their brain or their mind. So he said, I want to accentuate the neck to make the neck look longer to then make it to where it's holding the most, the thing they find most precious, which is the mind. And that was like a big turning point for me where I realized you can literally take actual history 
and take that language and then translate it conceptually into your design and then back yourself into having knowledge that then conceptually pushes you forward. So I've never forgotten that, but that was something that was really helpful. That's so smart, yeah. Yeah. You know what I liked was um, the cape in Doctor Strange, how that was a character. Yeah, how they actually Mm. painted an actual character. Right, because some costumes are, are pretty much like characters just by themselves. Yeah. Correct. You know, the that rock story, it it sounds really funny, but you know, at the end of the day, I think all you're really doing is personifying that rock. Yeah. And, and <laughs> trying to figure out, okay, well, if this rock was a character, how would they dress? How and would they dress? What would it be? That's right. Taking those edges on the, on the rock, or if it's a softer, rounder rock, maybe it's a softer rounded character and you start utilizing a small flex of color that may not be noticed in the first glance it's i love personifying things and so that oh that that sounds so much fun to be honest it was really fun it was a fun it was a fun exercise and it was almost like it felt like clue or something you're backing yourself into it like at the end of it then i understood what he meant yeah. um, but i had to go through it i had to go yeah. through the process hmm. Now, it's one of the most um, impressive uh, studios that create costumes is Marvel Studios because a lot of those costumes in the comic books, if you directly translated it into real <laughs> life, it's funny, right? It's yeah. funny. Like um, Captain America with the little wings coming off of the sides of the head, you know, it's like, why would you do that? Why would you need little (laughs) wings on your helmet? Uh, But the way that Marvel translates it into live action doesn't make it cheesy anymore. It makes it freaking cool. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Charlie, you've been, you were at Marvel right in the beginning, right? What was, was there kind of like a discussion of like, how are we going to make this cool? Or what was it like anyways, in the beginning of, Marvel. It was a good story. We were just sitting on top of a Mercedes dealership. And, um, you know, it's like I, uh, it, was, it was a meeting with, with, with Kevin Feige, and he was just it was right after um, uh, Spider Man. No, not Spider Man. It was right after um, Iron Man um, came out, the first Iron Man. And it was, you know, a successful movie. And his, you know, at the time, was like, well, how, how, let's just talk about trying to create something that you know builds it into a universe. And so, so the beginning was really about uh, universe building. You know, it was it was really just trying to think how we're going to build out a cohesive universe uh, that you know. And, and we, we that was sort of the first design challenge. And then, of course, that goes into like making sure these uh, these iconic. Uh, heroes are going to translate well onto this big screen. So um, there, there's less of discussion, like uh, big overall discussions about that. But there's a lot of discussions in, I mean, like, like what Phil was saying, back in um, on both Thor and like Captain America, um, this is before, those two movies were before we filmed, we, Ryan and I, um, Will form the, the biz dev department, but and because at the time we were still doing it more kind of the traditional way, where there was a costume department and then there was art department, and so the the biggest part though that we kept running into um, on Captain America, Phil, I don't know, do you remember all? Do you remember this part? I do. <laughs> right? Yeah. There's there was some. Uh, it was difficult because like um, the overall, you know, what we found was that. It was hard to, um, it, it was difficult to build a cohesive universe the way that we were bu- building. Correct. It. You know, and, and for designs to go across multiple movies, um, for it to get, to feel like um, it, it was all meant to be together, uh, we, we couldn't really do it the way that traditional Hollywood was set up. And so we had to kind of think about a different way. And, and that's why... Um, we started talking about forming a different group and yeah. uh, visual development was, was formed. I actually, I borrowed that from animation. So just because visual development came from animation. And so 
Um, I, I just didn't know what else to call it because it, I knew it was doing, it was more than maybe concept design because I felt like we had to cross many different um, uh, departments to, and really communicate with a lot of different departments. So uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of it was really just trying to think about cohesiveness at the time. And so the costumes were, were, were one of the first parts about that. Um, I don't know, I probably went off topic, but. No, that was smart. It was smart because they changed the way that they did it in order to ultimately protect the integrity of the co of the characters. And I think that that's Marvel's strength, which is they recognize that in the current climate and the way things were working, it was gonna be impossible to get a cohesive vision because you have, especially if all the departments are islands, like production design is doing something different than costume, props is doing something different than characters, environments, like all of those things needed to have a cohesive vision. And so I think what they did was smart because you can see it now, the product later, which is the Marvel universe for better or worse. Better or worse is the most cohesive, you know, it's a cohesive cinematic universe where there's nothing in it that feels like Oh, that's outside of it. It feels like it's all connected. And I think that was really, that was kind of, that was a big turning point at that, at that time. Yeah. Now questions are piling in. So I'm going to try to get to as many as I can. Um, all right. First one is from Dees. Dees asks, hello, what personal strategies do you use when you get stuck or have artist block? Good question. Take a break. Do <laughs> Take care of your plants and your cat. <laughs> yeah, look at your plants. Talk to them. Yeah, honestly, I have, I have around my apartment, like behind me, and I, I drill holes into my ceiling to like hang plants from my ceiling. But I have at least thirty plus plants mm -hmm. um, from my bedroom to the kitchen and in the living room. Um, and when I get when I get really stressed out, I kind of go on a propagating frenzy. Yep. <laughs> I'll take like all of my plants and I'll start cutting them up and, you know, replanting them and, you know, putting plants in water and stuff like that. And then I'll step back and I'll just go like, all right, let's do this. And then I go back. Like that's, that's my de-stressor. Yeah. Does anybody need tight deadlines to really get stuff done? Like if you got a big yeah. long runway, yeah. you just sit oh, yeah. there. Yeah. I will just sit around for 90% of that time. <laughs> <laughs> right? Undiagnosed ADHD going on there where Dude. I will just like obsessively think about the fact that I have to get work done instead of doing work. So yeah. anytime I can. In the last month or so. <laughs> yeah, especially during a pandemic. It's suddenly infinitely harder. So mm -hmm. I always try to at least set deadlines for myself to just force myself to have check-ins where I have to send things to people to yeah. really make that work happen. I love making art, but you wouldn't think it based on how long it takes me to get started making right. art. Right. You're not alone there, too. Yeah. Next one is actually for um, Claire again. Oh, shoot. What happened to my cursor? Okay, so Claire, when does In the Valley of the Gods release? And be careful of what you say about any of your projects, please. Uh, I really love your work, especially your Egyptian historical mythological paintings. I can't wait for this game. Uh, I don't know. It's um, We just came out with Half-Life Alex earlier this year. And so we all jumped off of Valley to work on that. Um, and Valve's very, uh, just things happen. I mean, people know what Valve time is. Uh, but there's a lot of love for that project at Valve. So I think... Um, It'll happen when it happens. <laughs> Wonderful. Nice blurry answer. I love it. I, All right. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> an emotional. I cannot answer. <laughs> Let's go to the next one here. This question is prim primarily for Charlie, but others uh, would be great too. How did you go about establishing the precedent for compelling design language for characters as, a, as iconic as the ones in the Marvel Universe without them feeling cheesy actually we kind of talked about this already right um with the visual development team but do you have anything to add to this you anybody else how do you keep from things looking cheesy like yeah i mean i think the thing that i would say about that is just um 
probably my favorite part about asset design is just maybe yeah. sorry charlie i don't i don't want to cut you off but can you speak closer to the mic so, yeah uh, the thing for me about concept design that I love most is really about uh, learning and because it's, it's the beginning part of the project where you're just um, learning about culture and learning about um, you know, just, everything is coming from some kind of culture usually. Right? And so like for Thor, for instance, you know, I, even though the Marvel Thor is, is has its own take, you know, and it's got recognized by the six discs and, and uh, it's more of an icon and so but um it, it's a lot of that was making sure i was studying norse mythology and you know, taking a lot of time to study um, norse myth and um, understanding design patterns and where those things came from and, and how that relates to the different cultures and so it was really about making sure culture was was put into pretty much every single one of the, 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 the um, superheroes that we were trying to, um, to create on, on the big screen. Um, so, so the more that we can really instill and, and you know, have you know, believable cultures in it, it, we felt like, okay, this is going to make sure that it's maybe not going to be as, uh, it's going to be more relatable. It's going to be a little bit less um, cheesy, hopefully. You, know, you can never really tell, but it's like we were very worried with Rocket and Duke, but um, you know it was uh, the same kind of thing goes for that. And, and for for that, it was really about bringing in a you know bringing in a, a raccoon instead of a raccoon. So it was really um, similar with uh, Goku. And uh, Kyle, I want to bring you into the conversation, of course. So um, how do you keep from making sure that your characters look cool instead of cheesy. Uh, you're muted. Hmm. Oh, uh, still muted. Sorry. No. It's getting there. Something's happening. <laughs> Get in there. <laughs> oh, while we're waiting, uh, we'll get back to you, uh, Kyle, with a different question. In the meantime, Mike, you want to talk about this? How do you uh, sorry, keep from? Uh, uh, yeah. So how do you, <laughs> you know, especially with fantastical characters, how do you keep them from being uh, not cheesy? Yeah, um, I think there's quite a few ways. I think one of the things to make sure is like giving them a real story. Um, for example, there's a bunch of superheroes that can really look extremely cheesy. Um, and like we mentioned before, like if we just use the comic books, they can look pretty corny. But I think one of the big things is like, how do they, how would they operate or how would they look cool like nowadays? And also, if you think it looks cool, there's a huge chance that there's a bunch of people who really are going to agree with you. And so I think one of the big things for myself is getting myself excited about a character and getting myself excited about the idea instead of just trying to go for you know comic book accuracy or something like that. Um, and also, sometimes it can be just me simply looking at something online and seeing like, oh, that's a really cool idea, but what makes that dope? And then just bringing that to the concept that I'm working on. Um, I think that's for me, one of the bigger things. It's just like, if I get excited about it, someone's gonna get excited about it. Maybe not everyone, but <laughs> someone. <laughs> Anybody else before we move on? If not, I think it's yeah. doing a little bit of uh, historical research that really helps. Because I feel like if you can ground something that is extraordinarily fantastical with something, even if it's just a little bit, with something that has already existed, and I don't, I don't, I don't mean the contemporary. I am going back to the past again. You know, if you can come up with something fantastical with inspiration from the Mayans or the Incans or you know um, the Egyptians or what have you, you the creations that you can come up with would be so high concept and so unique because 
at that point you're taking um uh you're taking ideas and inspirations from something that probably not a lot of people are looking at you know because a lot of people like to look at the present like to look at what they're surrounded by because it's it can be really hard for us to grasp what has been worn in the past like if you're like you see a massive dress and it's like how the hell did women walk through doors with that while well, they turned their bodies and that's how that happened but you know it's it's it really, it's difficult for us to figure out wow how did people back in rome dress that way and walk around with a boob hanging out or what have you but it's it, so it's it can be complicated but i i think if we can set that aside uh that fear of like bringing in the past into the present if you can set that aside then the designs that you can come up with can be so out of this world and then it'll it, it can stop them from being like cheesy or tacky or something you know i gotta say some of these costumes that right now are freaking awesome holy smokes they're so <laughs> cool looking uh i gave the mic to emma emma you, you do you have a question yeah um can you hear me Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So, hi. Hey. <laughs> Thank you all so much for this um, and for answering this question. Um, so, I don't know much about Marvelous Designer, and it's very expensive. So, there's no way I can touch it at this point. Um, but, like, when it comes to designing costumes and stuff, like, I really would want to keep in mind how to make things as easy as possible for people who are modeling it. Um, and so I would, I've seen like Claire, um, you've had, you have designs on your website where you make notes um, of like a simplified form that, you know, keep this in mind and marvelous designer and um, things like that. And I would love to make little notes and, you know, keep, um, helpful things like that in mind when designing stuff. Uh, but I, I don't know how to educate myself <laughs> really. Well, do you have any hints? <laughs> I will speak to my specific example. That was probably one where I was working with an outsourcer who I knew had marvelous designers. So it was like, this is part of the pipeline. It was very targeted. I need to, I needed to hold their hand because they had not made like complex 1880s gowns before. Um, and I didn't trust them to do it well. <laughs> um, but a lot of times the modeler themselves will be the people who are using or not using Marvelous Designer. Um, if you end up trying out the demo or getting your hands on a copy and getting a feel for it, that's great. And I think that makes you more, more of a powerhouse, obviously, being able to shift between 2D and 3D. Um, but I don't think it's it's a necessity. I think if you can just speak in terms of assembling actual costumes and how actual things are sewn together, that knowledge alone is more than enough to to hand off to modelers and be helpful. I'll say the same thing. I'll second. Uh, marvelous for us now, where some of us, uh, some of the costume artists are learning it just because we want to add it into our pipeline because it allows us to uh, it allows us to try out things in real time. Um, so we've been like trying out drapes, trying out patterns and stuff like that. Um, but it just depends on what you want to add to your personal pipeline. Also, sometimes they'll offer a beta test or they'll offer a testing of it or a trial. You could try that out as well. And then there's tons of free tutorials online for just like how to make a dress, how to make this, how to make that. So I would literally try to see if you could section yourself through some of that as well. And we have uh, Barry, you have the mic. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, Barry. Hello. Hey, what's going Barry, on? Barry. What's up? What's up? <laughs> uh, I have a question. So um, when you first started out navigating the professional space, um, when did you truly start to trust your design sensibilities? Because I imagine being surrounded by so many big names as far as artists goes can be not only intimidating, but uh just uh inspirational and at the same time uh kind of rough to to navigate that space like when do you truly start to trust your design sensibilities and and your weight and i think it's hard because you 
I think all the professional artists I know go through periods where you where we all just question whether or not we know what we're doing. Absolutely. <laughs> um, it keeps happening. It, keeps, oh, yeah, it literally keeps happening no matter yeah. what. Um, I do think that one thing, um, there was an, there's a concept artist who's also a big dev now, um, Keith Christensen. Keith told me one day I was having a full-blown panic attack. I was on like a, Mar uh, was it a Man of Steel? And it was the first time that I started using like photographs in my work. Like I was trying to photo bash with everything that needed to look a little bit more real. And I had, you know, done lots of traditional kind of fashion proportions and stuff like that. Um, and Keith pulled me to the side and he said, because I was around, it was him, Constantine Sakaris, Warren Manser, like uh, uh, Edna Tibby Dad, like these huge names that just their illustrations were beautiful. And I felt really overwhelmed. And uh, I was folding under that pressure. And he pulled me to the side one day and he said, Phil. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, he's like, you have to relax. And I was like, I'm trying. It's just really difficult. And he said, you're hired for what you know, not what you don't. And that one sentence allowed me to get back in the game. Um, and then from that point, you kind of continue on. And then, you know, then you'll work next to people like Charlie, who can draw and paint things out of his head, and then you feel the same way again. So it's just kind of like, it's kind of, it goes in and out. <laughs> but don't feel discouraged. I think you trust yourself, and then you don't. You trust yourself, and then you don't. The key thing is to keep learning and to get better. It's just I have, I have to agree 100%. Like, the first three weeks that I started at Netflix, every day, I was just like, am I here? Are they going to take this away from me? <laughs> <laughs> Like, okay. <laughs> you know when you get hired up you know when you get like scouted for a gig or whatever and they reach out to you and everything goes well and then there's like the initial like two or so weeks of pure silence and you're like they forgot about me didn't they? <laughs> this isn't they're not gonna they give figured me out they made a mistake yeah right that's... they made a mistake <laughs> they met some other person and then it happens and then commences the three weeks of oh this is a bad idea i don't know what i'm doing i'm surrounded by fucking titans <laughs> and then you know yes someone tells you hey you're here for a reason you are hired for a reason i love your work we're on the same level you know there is no one is better than the other you, you might do something better than i do i might do something better than you do but we can learn from each other at the end of the day and help each other grow and prosper as artists and just be there for each other. And look, at the end of the day, we can work our way towards being friends. And that is the beauty of it. At, we're all the same. We're all people, you know, we put our shoes on and walk around the house in socks and, you know, drink out of milk cartons. Well, I hate milk, so I don't do that. But, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 normal people do because we're normal people we just happen to be good at what we do that's all it is and i think we're kind of in this place where humans are weird i feel like humans have always been in this like idolizing sort of like mindset where it's like oh my god is that such and such over there and then you actually get to know them and then you're like oh hey what's up <laughs> I just sleep last night you know what I mean like so like once you break that barrier of like oh god this person has done 20 billion things and I've only done half of one it's like oh we're all still learning and we all make mistakes and we're all terrified and excited and yeah I don't know yeah that's how I like to think about it awesome uh Rochelle you have the mic wonderful testing testing one two three hello <laughs> Lovely work here. So I would like to um, ask a twofold question. What kind of exercises would you say helped you flex and develop your costume design skills? And what resources, um, what accessible resources do you pull from that, that give you this, that help bolster your mental library? I'm really quickly, Phil, you've already heard me talk about this book, but I it's like always next to me. <clears throat> for I think for anyone who wants to get into costume design, in, in my personal opinion, please get the book called What People Wore. Oh, when. classic. Mm -hmm. That's um, a good one. Cool. Absolutely outstanding book. Um, this book has it's over 300 pages of just illustrations and explanations and 
just deliciousness and the book smells really good so it's just all over <laughs> just a good time and it's not just a bunch of european costumes it's everything from all yeah. over the world everywhere that's a great one you got to get this book this is a fantastic book yeah You'll also, I'm going to do a plug, but you can see behind me all those colorful books back there. A lot of them are Marvel Biz Dev books. So those are great. So any of the art of books are great. Um, and then I love this book, which is Fashionpedia. Mm -hmm. um, so that book allows me, especially because I'm doing so many costumes, I'll give you guys an example. It does really simple kind of flat illustrations that shows you all the different types of terminology. So terminology is really important when you're doing costume because it allows you to search for things and find better research. So like you could search wrinkles or you could search pen tucking or you can search pocket or you can search well pocket. The difference in that search is all, is just, it's completely different. So if you can find a direct term, you'll have a better search. That is so huge for me, I, especially with historical fashion. I te mm -hmm. tell people that all the time. I was like, so many of these things, the book that Brie was bringing up are these great jumping off points. And you just have to learn how to research where you learn how to pick up on those specific terms. And you're just like, oh, the wire that supports a rough during the Renaissance is a summer <laughs> task. And you're just like, yeah. great, I have a yeah, word. Yeah. And instead of finding like <laughs> one yes. in yes. Google, suddenly you find like a ton of extant examples from museums, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. it just gives you the tools you need in a really yeah. compelling way. And oh my God, get books. Cause there's yes. nothing just compared to um, just flipping through a book and making accidental discoveries. No. Our, <gasps> go to the <gasps> library. <laughs> Right. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing sometimes. I would love to bring Armand into the conversation here because he's doing uh, Timeless, which goes through all the all these yes. different periods of time. How did you go about collecting the research besides just Googling it? You know, what, what's the secret sauce that you got going? Like Phil's got the library, you know? And when I heard that, I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I haven't been to a library in a long time. <laughs> Uh, no, it's, you know, sorry, I've just been just taking it all in, you know, and really enjoying it. But uh, what you can't see behind me is I've got a mass of amounts of books. And, um, you know, in the part of Timeless, it was a bit of writing and it was going to be illustrating. And when I set out to do it, I kind of wanted to, you know, I wanted to be like James Gurney and write a story and illustrate the heck out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing is, is that all the skills that I used in, in working in film and animation would come to bear on this. Uh, all the things that um, this is for the audience that you're hearing these phenomenal costume designers and character designers talk about are the kinds of things that go into designing characters for your own story or for your own book. Um, I would use these sort of references of historical, um, you know, how costumes look, but it was also really important to understand the cultural implications of a costume. So for example, if you just simply go roaring twenties, you can go from a simple pauper, somebody who is really poor, to somebody who is really wearing something, you know, quite elaborate and immense. Right. And, you know, the thing is, is, so when you're creating a character, uh, I like to think about the history of the clothes from the standpoint of the character's own personal choices. So there is you, the designer, there's you, the art director going, I like the way this looks, I'll use it. But then you, if you're creating a character, you got to go, would my character want that? Would my character, is my character a selfish person? Would he want to pick a piece of clothing that accentuates something to cover up his, uh, you know, his, uh, you know, what he feels insecure about, right? So you start getting into the psychology of the choices of design and um, using these books and then sort of reaching inside to sort of make characters real uh, go, plays a big part in how you uh, design them. And so I would use all these tools, you know, uh, in designing characters for, for Timeless. You know, a couple of years ago, or I, yeah, this may be like three years mm -hmm. ago. For a little while, I, I knew if I went into a pitch with a director and the director tells me his pitch, all I needed to do was say to that person, okay, I think what you need here is something familiar yet different and if i said that 
little phrase, then they'd be like, yes, exactly, hired. <laughs> and now I find the phrase is like wish fulfillment. Okay, I think what we need to do here is have a lot of wish fulfillment, you know, for the audience. And then they're like, yes. Are there certain kind of trendy kind of things that uh, producers, directors, that kind of thing, they, they kind of, you see a pattern? Hey, Bobby, can I make a random uh, magma studio question? Oh, sure. Or yeah. request? <laughs> can we not make D delete what's on your layer? <laughs> Because I, I keep using it to go to the default color oh. from Photoshop, and I have to keep deleting. All of it. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. No. <sighs> I will. I will put that on the list. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm gonna go repaint all that stuff. This is another book. <laughs> you can't undo. No, it only has like five undos. So only oh, no. five. Just not enough. Photoshop's oh, no. default is 40. What are you going to do with five? <laughs> <laughs> this is where I go away in shame. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Claire, I have a question for you. Do you know the book? It's Mine is up front, and I don't want to run away and get it. But do you know the book um, Kyoto? Oh, the Kyoto Fashion Institute book? Oh, do you have it? I do. It's like, it's like the, it's roll really backwards. thick. And it's a bit, it's, it's a stocky, thick book. And it has everything from the Kyoto, uh, Kyoto, the Kyoto, um, like fashion museum from like old to new. <laughs> it's not a good timeline, but it's, I used to, when I was Theoretically, to Kyoto, I have them. You, yeah, you have it? Where is I it? have them somewhere, but I can't fit all of my costume books on my shelves. Oh, <laughs> they, I feel like... that. I, yeah, I've got one, two, three shelves in my bedroom. But yeah. that's a that that book is also a fantastic book to have in your arsenal. Yeah. Now the next question here is from Natasha Chang. She says, "How does one break in the niche of costume concept?" I, I would love to bring this to uh, Mike. Mike, we I was there that <laughs> yeah. that event. I don't know what happened. You, you left and then you came back and you're like, I'm a costume designer now. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, what it felt like. <laughs> That's pretty much how that happened. Uh, no, I went to an expo um, because I was trying to figure that out myself. And I think the biggest uh, thing for me that happened that was very fortunate was I was trying one way that everyone was saying, and I realized that wasn't working. So I decided to do a lot of research on people who were in there, which is why I knew quite a bit about everyone in there before I actually met them. And one of the big things is um, I don't use social media that much, but I do like to speak in person. So I took advantage of that. And um, luckily working with Bobby, uh, when I was at the uh, expo, I went and had a game plan almost where I looked for everyone who I researched um, to meet them personally and show them my work. And um, that was at Comic-Con. And um, once that happened, uh, there was quite a few people who were kind of asking the question of, wait, who are you and why weren't you working already? And for one, that helped a lot. But two, it kind of gave me the, uh, the confidence to know that like, okay, like I'm past student level at this point, like, um, and kind of approaching people comfortably and confidently one-on-one, um, -on -one, you know, obviously making sure that I'm not bothering people while say they're trying to make a sale, right? Or if they're too busy. So um, I went to Comic-Con and I would just like go to each and every single company and or person that I thought um, would work in the desire, in the place that I desired to be. And because of that, I got really fortunate meeting someone named Sonia Hayes who uh, saw my work and once again asked the question of why haven't you been in here for a while? We actually would like to have you working uh, mm. in film. And I got pretty fortunate. Like it was almost like probably a week later I started working. Um, awesome. And it, it was just like a great thing. I was just like, damn. I, I, I felt I, the I, same I, thing when I saw your work. <laughs> I was like, 
yeah like i think i m maybe gave you like one little thing to change or something <laughs> but i was like yeah, shoot this is great really nuggets actually like um it was kind of funny that you like looked at my work for a second and you gave me a crit and the first thing i was like thank god someone actually gave me like took the time to give me one and then i immediately went home and worked on it and because of that uh that was when i think i started to see the results and so I think um, there's a there's a, sh a kind of like weirdness when some people want to ask for someone's opinion. They don't really want the truth. Um, and sometimes it does hurt. Sometimes it's, it can be harsh. But I really feel like when you actually listen and take the time to like, you know, take it seriously, it'll boost you like significantly and rather quickly. But it's just the hard part is just asking and knowing who to ask. Yeah, sometimes, you know, if people give me um, excuses while I'm critiquing their work, that's like instantly I'm like, okay, we're good then. Next mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bobby, I will say today from the, I'll never get over this, but from the five hour portfolio critique that Lara Carson and I did together, and then um, Lauren, oh, hate me, I can't, Lauren Brown that we also did together, um, everyone was so eager for our thoughts on their portfolios. And even, some of them we, yes, ripped apart uh, and, and, and put back together, but um, they took it and you could hear it in their voices that they wanted it, like they were desperate for it. Like for, they were desperate for like the real sort of portfolio critique that doesn't just say, oh, you're good, you'll be just fine, right? I'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. Or they, then you meet people that, that really want it. You know, they want yeah. to get torn apart, oh, right? Fine. It's like, <laughs> if you only gave good things to say, they're like disappointed. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right. That's yeah. like me at work when I get immediate good reactions to a thing I send in for the first time. And I'm like, are you, is this a <laughs> trick? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you do this to me? Be like, like I'm gonna you... redo it anyway. <laughs> this is good. Like sometimes you feel like, oh, maybe they don't they don't have time. They don't want to put in the effort to give you the yeah. real opinion, right? I call that the mom answer. Whenever, when anyone does that to me, I say, thanks, mom. Now give me a real answer. Like give me an actual critique. Like if I want my drawings to be like, that's so nice, dear, I'll ask my mom. Like I actually want you to, I want you to tell me what's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. You know what? Even my mom and my dad. So I went to, I've been drunk all my life. Right. I, I went to art. I went to fine art high school and obviously our university. But my mom and my nana have always had a hand in pushing me to draw better. Like my nana would always ask me, "Why aren't you drawing this? Why aren't you drawing that? Use this." I used to fence. I used to be a saber fencer, and so she would tell wow. me, "You need to have a saber fencer, you know, in your stories. You need to have this." That I, I well, I also played ice hockey, and I was the only girl on the whole team. It was so badass. But you know, she would tell me to design characters like that. And for such a long time, I, I said, it's not that I said no, but I always say, yes, yes, I know I'm going to do it. But like now that I'm a little bit older and that I have a much stronger sense of storytelling and character design, I'm like, God damn, she's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <She's so> right. <laughs> oh, there's a little gentleman down here. Oh, Sorry, gentleman. I just got to Wait. the bottom of my drawing. I was like, there's a tiny <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay, I left a little buddy for you. Thanks, Bobby. <laughs> I also drew a little Marge in the back just for fun. Oh, yeah. I drew on her face. I'm not sorry. <laughs> oh, it's on. It's on. <laughs> All right. Why don't we go to another question here? Uh, Jasmine. Jasmine says, when designing costume, how do you balance functionality and looking cool? That's a really Ooh, good question. That's yeah. a great question. Yeah. Um, I find that balance to be difficult. Hon uh, honestly, uh, the conceptual side of my brain always fights the functional side. Um, and then depending on where I'm working, I have to adapt or adjust to what it is. So I think as a costume illustrator, we're trained to think about function first, right? So we're trained to think about you're doing this thing. It's going to go on an actual body, you know, that type of deal. Um, but then conceptually, 
there's sometimes I just need to get out the idea. So I find to make it cool. So I'm just like, I want to draw this crazy shoulder piece. I don't care about if it's functional. I need to get it out of my head and then kind of back my way into it. So I feel like that's kind of the best balance I can tell you there is draw what you want and then back yourself into function. Because otherwise, if you do it the opposite way, you'll always block the conceptual side and that's not good. Like you need to be able to draw the things that are fun and then eventually you do both at the same time. But I think that uh, if you allow them to fight, they step on each other. Fantastic. Yeah, I've always, I have a little chart that I've always drawn out about sort of trying to find that middle ground between all of those influences. And as you were saying, it's about where you work, it's about the project you're on because so many of these worlds just need internal consistency. It doesn't matter if something's really stylized really stylized and conceptual so long as the whole world is and so if you're like Aiko Ishioka making costumes for the fall they're very aesthetic driven and just meant to look completely badass but if you're making a gritty realistic fantasy tv show it would not necessarily make sense Correct. and so yeah just constantly having that in the back <coughs> of your brain of who is this character what is the function in this universe and then what is the aesthetic you're going for and find that balance Fantastic. I always love ending um, talks with anything that we might have missed, any advice that you feel would be important to give, especially towards cons uh, costume design. For me, I think it's design respectfully, but don't be afraid to have fun and step outside of what we've already seen before. Because different, so disregarding, you know, American culture, different cultures wear different things for different reasons, right? And if we're going to pull inspiration from a culture completely opposite to your own, you want to do as much research as you possibly can, um, deep dive so hard before you even start drawing. Um, and I think once you start learning, okay, they're wearing this color or this pattern, or they're wearing that, you know, necklace or head garb or what have you, for whatever reason, you can make the smart decision whether to use it or not to use it. And if you're going to use it, how are you going to use it? And what is that going to say about your character um, or, or the person that you're designing that for? The more research you do, the better off you'll be. And, and that's not to say that like you're, you're over hydrating on research, you know, cause you're not. All that's gonna do is just inform your visual library and all that fun jazz. It really makes you much, a much more knowledgeable person. Cause if you, do, if you do design something that, you know, is unintentionally offensive to another culture and they come up to you and be like, hey, why'd you do that? Da, 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 da. It, you're gonna look real dumb if you're just gonna be like, oh, I didn't know. We're in the age of technology. Why ask, don't you know? Ask people. My God, ask people's ask lived people. experience, please. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh. Any other last pieces of advice? Um, this uh. isn't advice, but I have. I figured I should say I have pretty extensive and curated Pinterest boards for mm -hmm. historical fashion reference that oh, I keep. Right. Great. So yeah. If folks want to check that out. Pinterest, Pinterest, and um, uh, uh, Vogue.com. If you go to Vogue.com, you can look up every single designer and a bunch of their collection dating back to the '90s with high-res photos. So that's yeah. another one. That's another one that's really good, and I use those in conjunction. Uh, Claire bringing up Pinterest is really great. Oh, Vogue.com. I'll actually write it in the chat. Um, Pinterest is great because it. There you go. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Uh, Pinterest is great because if you think about it, it's like a curate, curated search it's like once you find what you're looking for it'll give you selections from that same thing so mm -hmm. if you're looking for something like uh you know like an architectural structural detail like crinoline cages it'll give you a bunch of them you know or whatever it is and it just helps you stay on topic uh but be careful because pinterest is a trap and mm -hmm. you, just, <laughs> mm -hmm. you can get uh, stuck in it forever uh i'm wrong with that Yes, it's good, but it's, it's definitely a trap, but it's awesome. <laughs> and uh, check the sources on your Pinterest stuff. Yeah. Always. Correct. Don't just be like, well, I don't know. It says it's from Bulgaria, so I'm going to assume it is. Be like, right. no, just do a backwards Google image search yeah. and find out. Yeah. 
I, I do realize that being an artist can be a little bit elitist. Um, we say a lot of these things by concept art books, this, that, and the other thing, go to the library, this, that, and the other thing. Not a lot of people can do that. And I completely understand and I respect that. Um, so if you do have access to the internet, use that to your best ability. Just just, just go hard on the internet. There's, there's so many things out there, so many references, so many old, old blogs that go untouched now or new blogs or what have you. Um, people like me, I, I mentor three character designers, you know, give out free classes. All you gotta do is just find them and, and it's out there. Um, yeah, that's my only my only little bit. Put a hole in your boot because you messed up my Marge. Oh, and that's the end of this me. talk. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. I want to thank our attendees. And most of all, I want to thank our amazing, our amazing uh, uh, panelists here. Thank you so much for sharing your time, your stories, your thoughts, uh, your knowledge. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks, y'all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bobby. Thank you.